Hello and welcome to this session at the Hay Winter Weekend with William Boyd. Um, and we're delighted to welcome William Boyd back to Hay. Uh, 15 novels is his tally so far, along with screenplays and short stories and criticisms. So it's an absolute delight to be able to talk about his latest trio. And um, it, it's set in 1968, um, largely on the south coast of England, and it concerns the um, film business largely, and three, as you might guess from the title, three characters. So I'm delighted that William Boyd is joining us now from his home. William, hello, thank you, welcome back. <laughs> thank you, Francine, very happy to be here. Good, good, good. Well, look, first, I mean, I've just, you know, the most basic outline about Trio is it is about three characters. It's about an actor or an actress, a producer and a writer. Uh, it's set in 1968. So just the obvious question has to be to start with why that moment and why the film industry and uh, it's sort of on reals to start with. Um, well, I think um, it's always a good idea if you're writing a novel to set it in the recent past because that uh, um, avoids built in obsolescence. Um, novels that are completely contemporary suddenly become old hat very quickly. And so I thought, I've been very interested in the 60s. I've actually been writing quite a few films and television series set in the 60s. And I, of course, was alive in the 1960s. And uh, I was 16 years old in 1968. And I'd just done my O-levels. And um, I th when I thought, when, when will I set this novel? Um, I thought the 60s first. Then I thought 1968, because it was a, a very interesting year. And it, it actually has a strange... Um, link to 2020, I think, because I think the world felt as anxious in 68 as they do in 2020, um, except in Great Britain. Uh, the rest of the world, the, it was going to hell in a handcart. The Vietnam War was in full swing. The Tet Offensive had begun in uh, January 1968 and almost overwhelmed the half a million American soldiers who were there. Um, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. Um, there was a near French revolution in Paris in May and June. Students taking to the streets, same in Germany, same in Italy, same in Mexico. Um, and after the assassination of Martin Luther King, there was the worst rioting and civil unrest ever seen in America since the American Civil War. So everybody living at that time um, felt oh my God, what, what on earth is happening to the world? But here in Britain, we were in our frivolous, swinging 60s, um, flippant mentality. And our, you know, the, the greatest concern is, were the Beatles going to stay together or split up? That's a, that's a bit unfair. We had our own issues. But there was, if you look at any history of the time, Britain seems like a little bubble of unconcern in the middle of this you know, global upheaval. And so it was a perfect year for me to plonk my trio down in, in the south coast of uh, England, in Brighton to be precise, and little parts of East Sussex, though we do go off to London for a bit and to Paris for a bit. But it was, uh, it was uh, one of those tipping point years in world history. I think uh, things changed thereafter, and maybe things will change after 2020 as well. But when I was writing the novel, of course, I didn't know COVID-19 was on the horizon, um, but in fact, it looks sort of prescient. Yeah, and I, th and I think that's a great sort of running joke all the way through that people are, you know, the événements are going, have been going on in Paris, but only a few people are aware of it. Uh, and in a sense, history is a bit like that, isn't it? I mean, it's not usually immediately apparent. It, it takes those decades before people go back and put it all in place in sort of history book order. Yes, I think it's absolutely true. I think the individual um, is obviously affected by historical forces, but... Um, it's often after the event or some time later that you realize how your life was buffeted by them. I mean, if you'd been um, around at the outbreak of the Second World War in, in England, would you have noticed the fact that you know, Nazi Germany had invaded Poland? Or was it the fact, would the most important thing on your breakfast table be your electricity bill? You know, it's that kind of a contrast between the individual experience and the the, the global historical significance is, is often blurred and very often the the individual um, only takes note of of the the larger currents of history uh, quite a long time after they've they've arrived 
So some of the, the earlier parts of the book are, are, are much concerned with the production or the preparation for production of this film that's being made in Brighton, in and around Brighton, uh, which is of that kind of whimsical 60s kind. There's some ter terrific descriptions of some of the scenes and what everybody's wearing and the kind of the idea of the montages of the shots. Um, so the film industry is, is depicted in a kind of amusing, um, but also affectionate way. I mean, you've had quite a bit to do with the film industry over the years, haven't you, both as a screenwriter and indeed as, as a director? Yes, yeah, so I've been in um, almost as long as I've been writing novels. I work extremely well. Uh, it, and I, the uh, collegiate experience that it is um, rackety and fickle and things can go hideously wrong very, very quickly. Um, this film is a typical film, British film of the 60s. There was a little boom of uh, filmmaking by British uh, filmmakers, which concentrated, as you said, on this sort of zany, wacky, you know, slightly saucy, very cool and groovy kind of ambience that existed in the country at the time. And um, the film that I have as a context to my trio's lives is is exactly of that type and it has a very stupid title like a lot of these films had at the time my film is called emily brace girdle's very useful ladder to the moon but i can give you examples of even more stupid titles of 60s films if you want but it's typical of that mood that seemed to exist in in britain um at in 96 which was in you know, strong contrast to the uh desperation and extremism that was going on elsewhere yeah and and the actress who is the, the lead actress is, is an american and, and again that sort of transatlantic import was not unusual or some sort of crossover at that time in the 60s i think donald sutherland's in a film called joanna that year you know that idea that you would bring in an american actor but of course, annie vickland i looked at her immediately and i saw the combination of that name and the surname, and I thought there were one or two possibilities, or one in particular. Who is she based on? Is she based on, or who's not based on, but who is she inspired by? Yeah, she's very loosely based on the American actress Jean Seberg, um, who, uh, and, and Annie Vicklund's uh, life sort of parallels the, the kind of life that uh, Jean Seberg, the short and tragic life that Jean Seberg had. And uh, Seberg is again a very 60s figure. She was very engagée. Um, she was involved in the Black Panther movement, Black Power movement rather. And um, uh, she, she ha was married three times. She was uh, married to a French intellectual, Romain Gary, a novelist. And so she was very much part of that slightly, um, you know, agitprop, um, politically aware uh, type of star that existed at the time. And so a lot of these American stars were, did pop up in, in British films. Um, and so I had, had my version of Jean Seberg pop up in this silly film that was being made in Brighton. Of course, she is a fish out of water, but her, her life, uh, uh, in her, her personal life and her private life begins to catch up with her. And in fact, the novel, even though it's it's a, it is a comedy and it is, uh, there is a lot of fun to be had with the film um, and the film world. Um, the darker currents are all to do with the secret lives of the three characters at the centre um, and the way that their secret lives, this the sort of nurtured private persona, um, are uh, begin to overtake their public lives. And uh, so there is a, there is a kind of mounting sense of of suspense in a way about what will happen when these secret lies finally break out but there's a lot of fun to be had in the meantime as this you know, rackety film gets made in brighton but and, and i guess also you know we're talking about the 2020 parallels uh, but there is a sense in which identity is also part of part of that too isn't it a sort of a, a 1960s way of, of grasping towards identity Yes, yeah, so I think it's something I write about a lot, actually, um, how people um, present uh, different selves to the world and how they create a personality um, as, as a kind of armour, in a way, to protect themselves against the world's vicissitudes. Um, there's, a, there's a young British pop star in the uh, film as well called um, Troy Blaze, 
um, and he's a bit like a, a Tommy Steele or Billy Fury or all these pop stars of the era. Um, but his real name is Nigel Farthingley, and his parents live in Swindon. And so I think that time and again, I find myself looking at the way people construct identities for themselves as a, as a way of succeeding in the world or even advancing in the world, but also as a way of, of erecting a kind of palisade around the private life that we all have at our center. We all have secret lives that nobody can penetrate and nobody knows what's going on in. And uh, this novel is in a way an investigation of, of those secret lives because as a novelist writing fiction, you have this enormous miraculous privilege of entering uh, other people's minds. And so I can, I can tell you what my producer figure Talbot Kidd is thinking, what my novelist Elfrida Wing is thinking and what my American film star Annie Vicklund is thinking. And it is, um, it is revelatory, I think. I think a lot of the novel's power comes from that ability to tell readers what is going on in people's minds because we, we can't tell that in real life because other people are opaque and mysterious. And so um, it's, a, it's a very great privilege of the novel, paradoxically, that something that's made up can actually direct you to a kind of truth. But, uh, and interestingly, since you've also written for, for the screen as well, that's something that you think the novel uniquely can do. That, that Do you not think films can do that? Uh, no, I don't. I mean, having done both, you know, I've, I've written many films and television series that have been made, and I've actually directed a, a feature film myself. And then, I've, so I've moved between the two worlds. And there's no doubt that the novel is a world of absolute total freedom. You can do anything in a novel. It's, uh, it's absolutely blissfully liberating. And as soon as you move to the world of film, and I, I include television in, in, in that category, you move to a world of uh, parameters and compromises and impossibilities because it may sound a bit stupid, uh, everybody knows it, but film is photography. You know, it's um, well, there's one point of view, the camera lens. And so it's all, you're always looking on, you're always on the outside looking on. And it's very, very hard to be subjective in a film. Uh, it may sound odd to say that, but compared to a novel where it's effortless, uh, trying to ex explain on film what somebody is thinking inside is difficult because the tools you have, because you're photographing people, uh, are very limited and very crude. So it's a, it's a real issue, I think. I mean, film has its strengths, of course, and I, you know, I love working in it. But when it comes to entering the minds of other people, um, it's a very you know, sad second cousin to what you can do in the novel. Now, you mentioned that the novelist Elfrida Wing, who uh, in the book, although she sometimes goes by an another name, she is somewhat in the shadow of Virginia Woolf or the work of Virginia Woolf. And then she's trying to write a novel at one point about Virginia Woolf's final day, which you pastiche just brilliantly. I mean, her various attempts at the kind of Virginia Woolf prose are just excruciating. But um, now, it, but is she, again, I was wondering, I couldn't immediately see that she would be anybody, although somebody has written a book about Virginia Woolf's last day, but <laughs> but she didn't seem to be her. Well, no, um, she's, she's very, uh, she's inspired by this novelist who everyone will have forgotten, I'm sure, called Rosemary Tonks. And uh, in the 1960s, Rosemary Tonks was a young writer who'd written three or four novels. And, um, and she was also quite an accomplished poet as well. And suddenly, through some sort of mental crisis, she just disappeared uh, from view. She, she vanished in the way you, you could do in, in the 1960s. And um, nobody knew what had become of her. And uh, she was eventually found 40 years later, I think in, in the West Country, it was, I think it was either Bristol or Bath or something like that, living in some, some sort of adjunct to a religious cult under a false name. But she had actually, her, her, her star was rising, she was becoming better known, but she decided or cracked up and decided to uh, run away from that world. And so Elfrida Wing, who is my novelist, who's sort of like, uh, Rosemary Tonks is in the in in a crisis. She's in a in a hideous writer's block. She hasn't been able to write a line of fiction for ten years. And uh, uh, I, I don't suffer from writer's block, but I know writers who do, and it is an awful affliction. And um, she's beginning to doubt whether she'll ever write another word again. And she has this 
she, part of the problem, she thinks, is that her first novel compared her to Virginia Woolf. Um, and so she got the kind of epithet attached to her of the new Virginia Woolf, and it became an albatross around her neck. And as she wrote um, a, a subsequent novels, uh, this Virginia Woolf comparison kept being raised again and again, and it actually stopped her from writing. And so as a way of her breaking out of her block, she thinks, I have to write about Virginia Woolf. And so she lights on this idea that Virginia Woolf committed suicide in March 1941. Um, and it's, uh, she decides to write a novel based on the last day of Virginia Woolf. That's the title of the novel. But of course, she never gets beyond the first three sentences, which she endlessly rewrites, try seeking perfection. Um, but uh, she sort of manages to you know, get the monkey off her back at the end of the at the end of the novel, I won't ruin it for anybody. But um, I have, a, I do have a lot of fun with uh, Elfrida's attempts to um, imagine what Vil Virginia Woolf did on that last day. And uh, she visits Virginia Woolf's house. She goes to the river bank. Virginia Woolf threw herself in the river ooze, uh, wearing a fur coat and Wellington boots, and with a heavy stone in one pocket, and she drowned. Um, and Elfrida. You know, almost reenacts um, Virginia Woolf's end, but uh, it, in a way, it sort of opens a door for her to to reinvent herself again, which she does at the end of the novel. So it's a. Uh, um, I, I spent many years at Oxford University teaching Virginia Woolf, and I think uh, I built up a kind of antipathy to her novels as a result. But I'm very interested in Virginia Woolf, the person, and. Um, uh, I think her, her, her life, the end of her life, is actually both tragic and very brave. And um, so it was an, a nice opportunity to investigate that mm -hmm. through Elfrida's attempt to cure her writer's block. Yeah, and I'm, I'm interested in your relationship with other writers because you do investigate, I mean, you know, you, you did teach literature at one time, but you do investigate their lives very carefully when you become interested in them. And obviously Evelyn Moore is, is another example. Um, do you ever find, you don't find that, as a writer, you never find that inhibiting, you always find that interesting, do you? Or, I mean, stimulating? Uh, yes, I, or? yes, I do find it stimulating. I, th I think um, if, you, if you love a writer, or if you revere a writer, or you're ob obsessed by a writer, you, you want to know about that person, you know, who, who wrote these books. Um, and I have certain, you know, fully fledged uh, obsessions. What one is Anton Chekhov, uh, Evelyn Waugh, uh, Muriel Spark is somebody who I actually met Muriel Spark, and uh, I'm very interested in Muriel Spark's life uh, because I've read everything she's written, and the uh, same applies to uh, other writers. It doesn't inhibit me um, as a novelist. It's a, it's a stimulation for me as a, as an individual. And I think it's something that that, that all readers share. That um, uh, if you if you engage with a writer's work. Um, I think after a while it's inevitable that you want to know a bit more about that writer and very often it can be counterintuitive. Um, the person you thought you knew is actually completely different but sometimes finding out about the, the writer, uh, him or herself, is absolutely fascinating. I, I must say that my investigations of these writers that I'm intrigued by has been you know, part of the pleasure of reading them. Mm. But and so you never think that the work should be considered entirely separate from you know because there is obviously a school of thought that says you look at the work as as pure. I mean, would you want people investigating you in the way for your fifteen novels as you do other people? Well, I think uh, they'd be quite disappointed actually because <laughs> I think you can divide you can divide <laughs> writers into into two types. There are writers who use their own life as raw material for their fiction. And there are writers who make everything up. And I'm definitely in that second category. I don't use my, my own life or my circle of friends or my uh, situation uh, as, as interesting material for my novel writing. I, I like to use my imagination. But there are many writers who um, you know, just turn their lives into, into their fiction. For example, to, you mentioned Evelyn Waugh. Evelyn Waugh is an incredibly autobiographical writer. Um, John Updike, also a very autobiographical writer. Graham Greene, no. And so I think it's a very interesting division. Um, I've actually just reviewed a biography of Graham Greene, 
and um, I, I never met him, but I've read everything he's written. And the, 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 the story of Green's life is actually quite at odds with the kind of fiction he wrote. Whereas if you read about uh, Evelyn Waugh's life um, or, or Chekhov's life, you get, you get an insight into the kind of fiction they wrote. So it's, it's, it depends on the type of writer you are, I think. And, and, the, and it's, it's, I think, pretty apparent whether you're an autobiographical novelist or not. And I'm definitely not, I say to my readers, so <laughs> um, no, no entry, no entry. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 I think you can tell from the novels I've written, they're all very different from each other, that I'm not recycling things that have happened to me. But of course, every novelist uh, as an individual, as a person, inevitably of themselves in um, but I don't do it in a deliberate, conscious way. So when you are going to 1960s Brighton or Paris or wherever it is, or whether you're going to be in Edinburgh, you know, 150 years before that or whatever it is, when you start out on your sort of three-year cycle with a novel, how do you begin to immerse yourself in that period? Well, it's the, the historical research is, is quite um, straightforward. I think um, I, I know how to look things up, having spent you know, many, many years teaching English literature and failing to complete a, a doctorate. Um, and so I, can, I, I know how to find out the answers to questions that I may have, um, you know, even very precise ones. For example, you might say, what was the street lighting in Edinburgh in 1899? You know, I can I can find out the answer to that question, um, and I use I use photographs a great deal. Actually, I find uh, photographs. You know, them, you know, I have a magnifying glass in hand, and often what's going on in the background is as it, as interesting as what's going on in the foreground. And but my basic process is I I get this idea which I can sum up in one sentence for a novel. And then I ask myself a series of questions and the answers I get to those questions provoke more questions and then more answers. And slowly but surely, as I answer the questions like where is this going to take place? Who is the hero or heroine? Uh, how old are they? What's their name? Slowly but surely, you build up this aggregate of information about this story you're going to write, this, this, this sort of seed that you have in your mind. And gradually, the narrative begins to make itself clear. And so you say, I'm going to start this novel in Edinburgh in 1899. And then you think, well, I need to find out about Edinburgh in 1899. You buy the books, you, you do the research, you look at the photographs, you look at the street maps, uh, you read the novels or whatever, you, all the material you need to provide yourself with the answers to the various questions you pose yourself. And uh, after, it takes longer, actually, for me to kind of figure out a novel than it does to write one. I, it, it takes almost twice as long to figure out the book I'm going to write and I don't start until I know exactly how it's going to end but the the process now has been the same um, and the same if I'm writing a short story or a film it's like a, a prolonged Q&A session you know um, and the answers get more and more detailed um, what color are the eyes of the woman he marries you know and uh, I have to have an answer to that and um, and slowly but surely the world of the novel begins to become very textured and granular as they say today and I have my world my fictional world and I have my narrative and I have my characters and when I know how it's going to end what the what the last page is going to be and what it will deliver in terms of catharsis to the reader then I can go back to page one and and start writing and, and that takes me usually about nine months to a year but I may have spent two years arriving at that uh, starting point. Because presumably that the danger in all of that is, I mean, you're doing so much wonderful research that there is, is there maybe a danger sometimes of falling in love with that research and it's seducing uh, you uh, down to it. <laughs> absolutely. It's a real danger. And uh, I can I can show you examples of novelists who have been seduced by their <laughs> research and uh, and have succumbed to to the allure. No, I think there's a real discipline that uh, that, that you actually have to throw out. 90% uh, of the stuff you have researched and found out, you have to, um, you, you, what you're looking for as a, as a novelist, as you research, you know, any, any period, 1968, what you're looking for is, is that nugget of uh, gold in the 
huge pile of slurry that you've you've dug out and um i think now i've been writing for so long i i know exactly how to do it and i can see in other novels and other novelists how they have made that selection and it's a it's a very it is an editorial process and you have to be ruthless with yourself you ha however you know fascinating and, and interesting uh, something you've discovered uh if it doesn't fit into your novel then you have to just throw it away um you can you can bring it up again in a pub quiz if you want but it's <laughs> it, it, it very quickly doesn't have a it very quickly is apparent to me that it doesn't have a place in the in the in the world of my novel but it, you have to be alert and you have to be you have have to not succumb to that uh, attractions. There's a, for example, there's a novelist I really love, J.G. Farrell, uh, um, uh, he, and he wrote a book called The Singapore Grip, recently on television. And uh, the trouble with Singapore Grip, which I think is not his most successful novel, is because he he succumbed to the uh, seduction of his research. And you're you're reading along, and then suddenly you get nine pages on how rubber is manufactured, and the novel you know f sort of sags and falls apart. And so. I would have said to J.G. Farrell, throw all that rubber manufacture stuff out and concentrate on what they, what the characters do next. But it is a, it is a mental discipline you have to impose on yourself. Mm. Yeah, and I suppose, it, I mean, in his case, he might have been rather concerned that people who knew about rubber manufacture might feel that he hadn't provided <laughs> sufficient context. And I suppose that's something that the writer has to have confidence to say, what the hell, yes. if you're an expert in rubber, you... look somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, or else you choose the one detail that shows the rubber expert that you know everything about rubber, but you haven't got the time to explain it. So it's that kind of you know, magpie um, element in your mind that you're looking for that gleaming fact or that gleaming bit of uh, information uh, that will do a lot of business for you and, uh, and kind of you know, have a ripple effect, effect through the novel. And uh, I, I, I can now recognize when I discover these things and um, and I can safely reject all those uh, all the piles of books I've, I've accumulated and all the notebooks I've filled with fascinating facts. It's a it's a it's a very selective editorial process, and uh, if it works, it 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 alludes to the huge store of knowledge you have, but you can't possibly factor into your novel. Okay, I'm going to bring in some questions from other people now. So Julia is wondering which new wave film, since we're talking about the 60s, is your favourite and to what extent, if at all, has it influenced the book? Uh, good question. Actually, I think uh, this is, I, I would have to say it's um, Breathless by Jean-Luc mm. Godard. Uh, which of course starred Jean Seberg and 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 made her a kind of new wave icon is Jean Paul Belmondo as well, uh, and I think the film came out in the very early sixties, it's pre nineteen sixty eight, and uh, it, I think it's probably Godard's most enduring film, and it was so revolutionary that um, it, it's almost a thought experiment to imagine what it must have been like to go to the cinema and see it for the first time because you would have been completely blown away by it. Um, and Goddard's technique and the things he introduced and the way he got his actors to act and improvise was like a breath of, you know, the most invigorating fresh air through the, the world of cinema. And I have a, I have a great friend who's a, a French film editor who was a young woman when, she, when Breathless came out. Um, and she said it was the most extraordinary experience to go to a cinema and watch it. So it still stands up in it, it, it even 60 years later if you watch that film it's still sort of shocking in its audacity and its you know vivacity and of course you'll see jean seberg at the very height of her her allure and her her, her stardom and her factor x you know, quality and belmondo is astonishing as well so i think that gets my vote but yeah, it didn't, and it, it didn't really it didn't really influence the novel except that, that, that um, I was have been aware of Jean Seberg since I'd seen that film. I got interested in her life and 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 I and, and I used her life as raw material for for Annie Wicklund's life. Mm. And there's something about the openness that I can see also of Seberg's performance in that that is, uh, you know, the, the kind of the way that she is so available to the camera that that is there is something of that in perhaps in in Annie as well. Yes, and I think it's it's timeless. You know, it's amazing that that perform both of them, Belmondo and and Seberg, 
are extraordinary in that in that in that film and um it's uh it's it's incredible how uh how it survives all these years that still has this amazing freshness and naturalism about it it's a, it's a great film eugene is wondering what you've been reading in lockdown oh gosh um it's quite I've a lot actually been, think. yeah yes i have been reading uh, uh, massively i've been incredibly busy in lockdown i think all writers have been busy in lockdown because you know we we are kind of locked down anyway this is uh, this room i'm in is my study and i uh, you know i i've been doing what i always do i'm in here writing and reading and thinking and um so in some say, some sense my right working life hasn't changed at all i've been reading a lot of um books about um uh, the assassination of john fitzgerald kennedy i'm, I'm writing a, a a long form tv series that's set in 1963 which is when he was assassinated of course and so i've been investigating the multitude of conspiracy theories um around his death and have have come to a conclusion um which i'm going to use in my in my series and um, so i so i have got a i've been reading a ton of books about uh cia assassinations and uh lee harvey oswalds and and so on and uh it's a very, very murky tale, in fact, but we mustn't be distracted. But so, so I think that's been a large part of my reading. And um, I'm actually beginning to read books for my next novel as well, which I've, I've you know, I have the idea and I'm in this Q&A period now and I'm thinking when's it going to be set and who are the principal characters and what will they do and uh, and so on. So I'm, I'm beginning to read around that as well. And... Uh, um, so I, I, I'm, I'm a voracious reader. I have a, I have the terrible, uh, you know, affliction of buying too many books, and uh, have a terrible book storage problem, um, <laughs> which I don't know how to solve. And um, but you know, it, hey, it's not the worst sin in the world. And um, so I, so I'm reading avidly. I read a, I re read, uh, I read novels as well. I read Martin Amis's new novel, um, Inside Story, because I, I, I know Martin Amis, and I, I knew Christopher Hitchens, who's one of the characters in it. Uh, a bit, and um, I've read a wonderful novel by a young uh, novelist called Evie Wilde, called The Bass Rock. It's her third novel. I've read all her novels, so I've been, you know, usual eclectic stuff. Um, uh, but uh, a busy, a busy time. Even though my, you know, social life is non-existent, uh, 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 me and my wife Susan are holed up in our house. Um, but uh, the, our work. She's a writer as well, screenwriter. So, but our working lives are. You know, remarkably unchanged. Martin, not that Martin, I imagine, but Martin yeah. asked, do you think yeah. filmmaking is a passive or active art form? Well, uh, interesting question. It's, it's active, of course, because you re require a huge number of people to make even the simplest, uh, most low budget film. And it's a very, uh, it's a very collaborative art form. But it's it, coming back to this idea that it film is photography. It, there is a sense in which um, the fact that you're producing an image of the story or telling does make it you know, brutally, ruthlessly objective. And I suppose you could say that was a kind of passive state to be in, that you're just looking on at what's going on. Um, of course, you have created that, but the, ex the experience of watching a film is, is, I think, different from reading a novel because of this spectator-like quality of the of the process. Um, you no know, novel reading is a very unique, intimate act of bonding with the novelist, and it's it's um, a totally different form of immersion than I think watching a film. Um, so there, there is, you're right, it's a good point actually, I, I hadn't really considered that, but there is a, there is a sense in which you're, you're um, not exchanging, you're just receiving it when you watch a film, um, though of course you react to films, you don't like it, you, you find it moving, you find it shocking and so on, but there's somehow, it, somehow it's more served up on a plate than in a novel where your, you, your brain as a reader is engaging with the, the novelist's brain on a unique one-to-one -one level. 
Oh, I have to chip in there because I think that's mm, I think that's interesting. But I think there's another dimension there as well. And I don't know whether Martin would agree with this or not, because there is an argument that I mean, you were talking just now about the fact that uh, you can't show what somebody's thinking on screen. What happens then is is that a lot of the greatest screen actors are very good at being still, aren't they? I mean, that, that's their that's their technique, not so much showing you what they're thinking, but they're very good at remaining still so that you, the viewer, impose upon them what you think's going on. So in that sense, it probably isn't quite as passive as all that. Yeah, a good, good point, Francine. Uh, you know, that you, this phrase that, you know, what's going on behind the eyes is all important. And yet, and yet, you know, the best actor in the world, and I have worked with phenomenally good actors, um, cannot replicate one paragraph of a novel. They cannot replicate the nuances and the subtle shifts, however brilliant an actor they are, because it's just impossible to read as a viewer. But you're absolutely right. You know, a great actor can suggest things um, that uh, you know it infuse the the moment of the film, but it, if you analyze it, I bet you this: if you analyze it, and said, "What are they suggesting?" It's actually quite simple. You know, I'm embarrassed, but I'm pretending not to be embarrassed, or I'm I'm terrified, but I'm pretending to be calm. You know, that's the level of that great acting can uh, re reproduce human emotion. But a paragraph of that in a novel. Is, is mind-bogglingly detailed and, and can go on for page after page. So I, th I do think they are d totally different art forms, actually, and the, f the fact that they're often mentioned in the same breath is a disservice to both of them. They, um, but I, I do think that subjective life in a film is, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, is a very simple version of subjective life. Ben uh, asks, uh, the 1960s perhaps saw the biggest change in popular culture and cultural political awareness. Um, would you agree with that? And will the 60s always be seen this way? Well, that's quite hard to know. but <laughs> uh, I think there was a, a great shift, actually, in, um, in, the, in the zeitgeist in, in the 60s. Um, and it's, it was, I think, generated by... Um, young people, um, if you look at, if you say 1968 to a German, for example, they go, oh my God, you know, social revolution, everything changed. And uh, post-war Germany became a different country after 1968. Um, sa same in America to a degree, though you might think that th time has rolled back those advances. Um, but uh, student protest and and the protest movement in the 60s is, is still with us today whether it's you know workers rights uh, gay rights feminism all, all these all these movements that are, we're still living with or let alone civil rights and let alone um you know some a figure like uh, martin luther king uh, you know you could argue his legacy is black lives matter um so i think the 60s are very much still with us and the, the social upheaval that took place um, affected the way people thought and reacted, um, it, but it took time. You know, there was a, there was a lot on the surface, um, and but the, the, the establishment was very entrenched. But I do think the 60s was a time of, of revolution in every aspect of human life, uh, you know, sexual, social, political, uh, et cetera. Uh, and we are still, you know, the beneficiaries of that uh, bravery and audacity to to take to the streets and uh, and try to change the world. To quote Susan's a song, <laughs> <laughs> indeed. Mm -hmm. um, Susan is is wondering whether you could talk about your teaching of literature and the way it has impacted your writing. Uh, very good question, actually, because in a way, I mean, I spent um, at least how, let me think twelve years at university studying English literature and then teaching English literature um, in great detail and in some senses that's the worst thing you should do if you want to be a novelist because you're aware of the the great tradition lurking behind you and so what, I, what it's given me I think is the ability to, to sort of strip down and, and disassemble any novel and then reassemble it I, I, can, I, under, I, can, I know how novels work I can look at Wuthering Heights 
pull it apart and see what 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 makes it function as a as a work of fiction and i could only have done that as a somebody who'd studied and and, and taught literature uh, and i think it has helped me a lot in the way i structure my own novels which are quite complex usually so i know how the nuts and bolts of uh, novel writing work as a result of my you know years at university um, but it's a kind of it is a kind of technical mechanical knowledge it, it doesn't help inspiration or it doesn't make my imagination work better it just helps me in things like you know when to end a chapter and start a chapter or can you have three voices in a novel as i do in trio uh, or should i just stick with one but i i i, I understand the the way the moving parts of a novel work and that's because i spent so long you know analyzing literature so i have a technical um advantage but basically you're thrown back on your own imagination your own instincts and your own personality i think when it comes to writing fiction but once the imagination takes over i mean is, is there ever a, a moment where you think well i should be finishing the chapter here but you know what <laughs> i think i should really go on a bit more well, you, you get, of course, you get ideas as you're as you're writing. Um, but I, I've never been uh, taken over by my characters, which is a, I think, a bit of a romantic myth. I, I always like to quote. Uh, I like to quote Vladimir Nabokov, who's one of my favourite novelists. And and Nabokov was asked, you know, do you, exactly that question: Do you find you're writing, and suddenly the characters have taken taken over, and you're being led in directions you never expected? And he said, uh, No. Um, all my characters are galley slaves, and I'm the man on the deck with a whip. And uh, I'm sort of, I'm sort of like that. You know, it's so because uh, I spend so long planning a novel yeah. and thinking about it uh, and figuring it out and making all my mistakes before I start writing. Um, I, I really have quite a clear idea of the book I'm going to write. I sometimes get brilliant ideas, or so I think halfway through, and I make changes. But I have a destination when I start writing. And I sort of follow that, you know, fairly relentlessly, uh, unless I unless I'm surprised by some idea I have, not an idea my characters have. So um, uh, I do make changes, but I'm not I'm not so, I'm not kind of in a kind of trance waiting for uh, for the story to be revealed to me or for events to happen. It's all very thoughtful, and I I suspect that almost all novelists are exactly the same, whatever they might say. <laughs> so, I mean, as we're getting towards the end of, of our time here, I mean, given the opportunity to, I mean, we know how exciting the time 1968 was, and, and we've talked about the significance of that decade. I mean, given the opportunity to have been a bit older than just having finished your O-levels, then would you like to swap that time for now at all? Um, I don't think so, actually. Uh, I, I, I think the here and now is the place to be. Um, it's, it's, there's often a question you ask, you're asked as a, so what, what period of history would you like to live in? And I often think, oh, I'd really like to have lived in Paris before the First World War from 1900 to 1914. It used to be the most exciting city at the time. And then I think, well, what if I had a, you know, root I needed root canal <laughs> treatment, you know, uh, or, or uh, uh, I had a hernia, you know. Um, uh, so I think that time travel in the mind is fine, but actually the, 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 the time you live in is, is the time to concentrate on. And, uh, you know, I was, I was alive and functioning in, in 1968, um, and uh, I, had, I was having a nice time, but I don't, I don't particularly want to go back there. I'm quite happy with 2020, even with the hideous problems we're currently facing. <laughs> well, that's right. And the, uh, so if you had another film recommendation from the 60s beyond Breathless, something that people might, you know, if they'd been reading Trio and they wanted, they wanted to think of, uh, wanted to watch something, I mean, would it be like The Knack or would it be something? Uh... Well, actually, I think the, the, the film that um, launched this wacky, crazy, you know, British, the short-lived movement of British cinema was a, a film that Richard Lester made about the Beatles called The Hard Day's Night. And a Hard Day's, it, it, Hard Day's Night really stands up, actually. It's amazing. And all the kind of 
aspects of that film it's it's kind of craziness it's kookiness it's 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 meta aspects it covers 36 hours in the life of, of this band the beatles it, it's still a very engaging film and it, it sort of is a perfect introduction to the 60s it was made in 1964 i think and everybody ripped it off afterwards so it's kind of original uh, original movie that set a, a little film movement going but it's also very much of the time and it's it gives you that atmosphere absolutely perfectly and of course you get to hear some great Beatles songs along the way <laughs> and uh, and given that we're all going to have you know fairly more or less fairly quiet weeks ahead still for a while how about some reading suggestions then from the uh, the either from the former literature teacher or, or from <laughs> things that you've recently been reading. What would you suggest we go to right now? Um, well, apart I, from I your think, books, you obviously. Know, yeah, apart from my books, yes. Um, I think, I think um, what am I reading at the moment? Uh, just looking at this, I, 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 I'm, reading, I'm reading a lot about the uh, uh, romantic period of English uh, literary life, uh, the early 19th century. And um, there's a, a wonderful, but I, st I did my th my thesis, which I never finished, was on Shelley, the poet Percy Bysshe Shelley. And so I'm rereading a biography of Shelley by Richard Holmes. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was a kind of revelation to me when I read it in 1975, uh, when I think when it came out. And that's what made me want to write a thesis about Shelley. So it's very interesting after all this time to go back and read Holmes's biography again. So. I think um, there's a, there are, there are one, he's written wonderful books on Coleridge as well, but I think, you know, seek out those poets of the, um, of the early 19th century, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Shelley and Keats, and read about their lives um, and read their poetry. And it's, uh, it's, it's very stimulating. It's very radical as well, actually. It's, it's a very real 1960s feel about the 1820s. And so, um, uh, you know, take yourself on a, on, a, on a time travel trip and revisit the beginning of the 19th century is my advice, my advice through, the, through the lives of, uh, of these great poets. Great. Well, that's, what, well, that's wonderful. It's a good, a good <laughs> suggestion to have. Um, yeah, I suppose uh, going back to that sort of cinema analogy, books then, the ultimate time travel, you think? Yes, and, and of course, you know, the book is the most incredible invention. It's, uh, it's like the wheelbarrow or the button or the, or the fork, you know, it's, uh, it's never been, re or the umbrella, you know, it, it, it will never be replaced. Um, and it's, it's very light, it's raw materials are infinite. Um, you can give it to other people. Uh, you can immerse yourself in it for 10 minutes or for three days. Uh, books are the, the, the most wonderful way of transporting yourself into other times and places, but most importantly, I think, into the minds of other people. And that's the novel's great power. Well, William Boyd, thank you very much indeed for spending this time with us uh, this afternoon. Um, William Boyd's novel Trio uh, is in the... the Hey, Winter Weekend Bookshop has got signed copies of that, so please do get through there. And I thoroughly recommend it for a little trip back to 1968. Um, but very grateful for you for joining us and particularly William Boyd for his time. Thank you.